from Microbe TV. This is Q&A with A and V. I am Vincent Racaniello, and joining me tonight from New York, Amy Rosenfeld. Hello, Vincent. How are you today? I'm very well. How are you? Good. I don't, how come I don't see the questions? Maybe the chat window isn't open there? No, it's because I'm not beside you and my viewer. There's something wrong. Oh, well, we'll have to look at it on Friday. Before we start... Uh, uh, I with... don't know if I have time. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to show everyone this cool paper that Amy and colleagues has published. It came out just this week in MBio. Cross-reactive antibody responses against non-polio virus enteroviruses. That's very cool, Amy. Yeah, I'm very excited about the results in the whole uh, direction. Yeah, for sure. It's very cool. You it's going to be do, great. Do you want to give a brief synopsis of it? Their cross-species anti-enterovirus is antibodies elicited during enterovirus infection. And they have distinct characteristics and neutralize a distinct set of viruses. So they're antigenic groups of enteroviruses. And this is really important if you want to do a pandemic preparedness program based on, get this, immunosurveillance. But that's not really sero that's not really a serology uh, sero prevalence study. You know? So was this finding unexpected? Yeah, it was totally unexpected, right? It goes against what people thought was it was uh, enteroviruses and and disease was totally dependent upon homotypic immunity, not heterotypic, and had no influence of heterotypic immunity. It also expands our understanding of serotype and serology. It makes it so that, you know, you can't really use seroprevalence surveys to understand what viruses are circulating since we're immunized with polio very early on and stuff. Um, when did you start the work on this paper? Uh, so we started like April and we finished September. So it took, right. took four months of my work four months of work for so me. twice a week i come up to columbia and on tuesdays we immunize mice and on friday we bleed them and then amy takes the serum and does neutralization and binding assays with different enteroviruses right yes 30 some eyed enteroviruses so far it's very cool and it is really a big deal i think and has broad implications for example if you Let's say take serum from people and you do neutralization with Entero 68. You say, oh, 20% of the population is seropositive. That may not be correct because antibodies to other enteroviruses can also neutralize EVD 68. Yeah. So, so it requires a uh, rethinking of uh, antigenicity and, and so forth in viruses. It, yeah, it expands. It also requires a novel as to remember uh, all of the pitfalls of polio. So when they defined the three serotypes of polio, it wasn't that easy. There were many isolates of polio that when they took serum that they decided was serotype one and serotype two and serotype three, and they tested these untyped viruses. They didn't always fall into simple categories. There were many isolates that could be neutralized by multiple different uh, serum from different from you know the cannot what they called group one, group two, and group three. Right. So we're just falling into the same pitfalls because we didn't remember history. Not so good. So uh, who, the sweater is red and gray, right? Orange, it's tangerine. Okay. <laughs> this week in sweaters. This week in sweaters. All right, so since we have um, Vanity Nutrition here, we can <laughs> address this question from Rob. Is everyone move, removing their mask at TSA checkpoints for theatrics, a potential infection point? 
well, I have to see your face, right, to see if it matches the ID. Is it a potential infection point? I think. Well, the guy the, is wearing a mask, right? The guy's wearing a mask, and you're supposed to be isolated from everyone. You take it off for five seconds. I don't think so. Plus, I'm sure he's a government employee. He has to be vaccinated. But then his part two is why do they need to serve cookies on board flights encouraging everyone to take off masks? They <laughs> and, still serve food? Really? Yeah. So, Vanity, what? What, what is it? Story? You have to feed people on long flights, right? Oh, I thought food was no longer served on flights. Yeah, you have to buy it on, on like U.S. flights. International, they still, certain airlines, well, at least United used to in 2019, give you food. Yeah, but I thought since the pandemic, they no longer served food and drink on flights. It's like you even, even like they now announce on the subway, you're no longer allowed to eat and drink on the subway cars. Now, whether or not people abide by that is a separate question. So Vanity says you have to put pull down your mask for security and then are expected to put it back on and continue to wear it for the rest of your travels. All right, so then Vanity, why do we have to feed people on flights? Do, well, do we maybe really, we don't anymore. <laughs> do we think Americans are going to starve <laughs> coast to coast? Well, did you get cookies on your flight to Houston? Uh, no, I got uh, food. Food service has been brought back. It's like they're trying to serve their way out of the pandemic. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I ate food on my flight to, to uh, Austin and back. Yeah. I took my mask off and ate, and then I put it back on. You know, Columbia issued that you can no longer wear a cloth mask here. Really? Yep. Oh, I, have to, I do have a... I better bring in my surgical mask tomorrow. Can you text me in the morning to remind me? No, I'm not coming in tomorrow. It's Friday. Yeah, yeah to, the, to Columbia. Text. What do they think? Where's the data? I guess so, that paper from Bangladesh made that conclusion, right? Well, it didn't, it is, so it's not from the paper from Bangladesh. It's from studies by Corti and others that say a cloth mask only uh, reduces something. It gives you 50%. I'm and fine it's with also that. The, C, the CDC guideline. No cloth? Is that the cloth mask is the least protective but but what's the data for that do you know there are studies by corti that say it's only it only prevents 50 percent of the stuff going through it okay purifying the air all right so i'll wear a surgical mask it's fine i i, I kind of like the cloth because they're mine is black i think it's cool but well you can buy a black surgical mask how about an n95 could i you can K get an, a black N95, sure. I have a, I have black KN95s. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Anything? They're uncomfortable, but sure, go ahead. All right. Taylor wants to know, who do you think is more likely to die from COVID, a triple-vaxxed individual who suffers from obesity or an unvaccinated individual with zero comorbidities? Depends on the age. Okay. <laughs> You're right. I think it is. Uh, Amy, what is the most difficult lab technique to learn? <laughs> Getting along with your colleagues. Okay. Not, it's not a technique, right, Amy? Sure. It could be a technique. What, what, in your opinion, of all the techniques you have done, what's the most difficult to, to learn? Uh, well, I was least successful at doing Northerns. Okay. Northern blood analysis. All right. Let me see. Let me reach back into my limited arsenal. Uh, I, I would also say I wasn't very good at Northerns. I didn't try all that much. Yeah. All right. Uh, no, that's somebody else. My first time catching this. Very good. Welcome, Wayne. Thank you very much. How do we ever figure out a virus's pathogenicity, virulence, and contagiousness if lab testing has its limitation and epi epidemiological data is purely observational? Amy? Um, so, so virulence and so uh, virulence is determined, uh, you can only determine it in the animal that you can experiment on. So you cannot extrapolate virulence in the mouse to virulence in a human. It's not possible. 
Pathogenesis is the symptoms of the disease. Humans display symptoms all the time. It's not epidemiological. It's observational, right? Your head explodes. You have diarrhea. Mm -hmm. You can't walk. Yeah. And then your animal, you, your model tries to recapitulate that. Some are better than others. Others are completely off, like microcephaly and paralysis. Not the same. And what was the last, what was the third one? Contagiousness. What is that? Contagiousness? You can't model. You you can't define for anybody outside that animal. But it's really hard for animals because they don't always, uh, disease does not traffic between them in the same fashion as they traffic between us. So it's really hard if you have like a respiratory disease because mice don't sneeze and stuff. So it depends on the animal. Plus I'm really kind of confused about what contagiousness, what they mean by contagiousness. I think it's transmissibility. So you can't, you can't do that outside of the animal that you can experiment on. You can't extrapolate. All right. So then in the Omicron paper out of, out of uh, Denmark, they concluded from, observations of, of infections in Danish households that the greater uh, transmission of Omicron is due to immune evasion, not an inherent increase in transmissibility of the virus. So they made those from studies of vaccinated twice, unvaccinated twice and three times vaccinated people comparing Delta to Omicron. So isn't that one way of doing it? Sure. It's a, I mean, it's a, it, it's suggestive, right? Sure, I agree. It's not concrete proof. It's suggestive. Agreed. It's not a concrete proof. So Jack says Australia has reduced the interval between those two and the booster to three months. Should I still wait five months or get in the yes. booster? Wait five months. I think the data say five to six months. CDC just re reduced it to five months, Amy. Did you know that? Yes, and I disagreed with that policy. Steve says, watching case counts in South Africa fall as fast as they rose, do you think they're out of the woods now? According to David Kessler and some others, yes. South Africa's out of the woods? What does that mean, out of the woods? That the Omicron spike has passed. They've passed their peak and they're coming down into a controllable level. Yeah, everyone else will so do the same. So they're out right? of the red zone. Okay, that's good. But they all come down eventually. All the variant peaks go up and down, right? Yeah. So Eleanor wants to know if any of the TWIV team ever tune into these Q&As. Would be fun to have Alan or Dixon, Richard, Brianne in the chat. No, I don't think they do. Uh, I think they probably feel they do enough with TWIV. Um, so this is Amy's show here. It's not my show. Brendan says, Omicron is evasive, so Omicron is invading our immune systems. Why Did you listen to the episode, Brendan? Do you understand what we're saying by the title? It's evading antibodies. The T cells are still there and probably are protecting you, or what are protecting you against severe disease, and that's why we're not going to have a rise. Yesterday, uh, Alessandro Sette on Twiv said, there's no evidence that the variants are becoming progressively resistant to T-cells. There's zero evidence. So, it's not happening. Uh, why do you think a pandemic of this magnitude took 100 years to emerge? We didn't travel as much. I think it's just chance, random chance of encountering the right virus from the right bat. That's part of it. But the other part of it is we've never traveled as much. Travel has yeah. been very cheap and we're a much more global society and economy. So you than think we have ever been even more than for SARS one? For sure. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Okay, Gout from Fried Okra says, Dr. John Campbell said, future variants that's more transmissible and pathogenic than is not genetically possible. This from a person who has never studied a virus in his life. So I would say just 
Not, he doesn't know what genetically possible is, folks. He's out of his lane. Well, that's not good. When the car goes out of your lane, you usually get honked or cause an accident. That's definitely not good. We don't need a road crash. So it's not intrinsically more transmissible than, than Delta. We already concluded that from the Danish study. He probably hasn't understood it. Joshua says, I had one Astra three months later, one Moderna, and just over six months the Moderna this week. I was crazy sick, fever, joint pain, muscle aches, headache. Is that typical? I know people, yes, who have similar reactions. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Sadly, South Africa, Australia made it all the way to a month ago with just four deaths, and now we have 50. Well, that's still pretty low. Five and a half million deaths globally. Wow. If I space those... Oh, so this came up uh, many times, but it's worth addressing. If I space dose one and two six months apart, will I even need a booster? No. Yeah, I don't think so. Hey, this is good. No person is a failure who has T cells. <laughs> That's true. I really like it. Yep. Have seen media throwing around T cell exhaustion in the context of multiple rounds of boosters. Is it relevant? Cue in the question list for future doctor. Well, that set they was on yesterday. He didn't even mention exhaustion. I don't think it's a, it's an issue. Uh, with, I don't think it boosters. generally is discussed outside of HIV. Yeah, so the media don't know what to throw around now. So someone must have clued them in, though. They must. Someone must have said something about T cell exhaustion because they wouldn't come up on their own, would they, Amy? No, but normally you don't talk about it outside of HIV. So somebody who must have been an HIV person probably said it. Maybe the person who's all about antibodies. Who knows? So Anna says, what would you say to friends that refuse to get vaccinated because they have already had it twice? Well, you know, this came they up. They don't actually need to get vaccinated. <clears throat> so Sete, Amy, said yesterday that uh, it's better to get vaccinated because the immunity, I know you don't like this, but the immunity from infection is heterogeneous, he said. <laughs> now, he's, a, he's an immunologist, man. Give me a break. Everything's heterogeneous. There has actually been a JAMA paper that I text you and Daniel that said that you actually get better immunity breath from infection than you do from any vaccination, whether or not you are double vaccinated or triple vaccinated. I don't believe he's in that is like the crap that Cromer spewed out because he couldn't accept the fact that actually it's better your immune response is actually better when you get infected it's just wrong and to say it's heterogeneous everything is heterogeneous then your your response to to the vaccine is heterogeneous i'm heterogeneous yeah so it doesn't make any sense could you discuss the role of crispr had in development of mrna vaccines None. None. None whatsoever. Totally independent developments. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry to disappoint you. This this comes up almost every um, Wednesday. What is original antigenic sin? So this is a phenomenon that occurs with influenza viruses when, let's say you get a vaccine, if you have been previously vaccinated or infected, whatever the first exposure you have had to an influenza virus, you make a memory response to that one and less so to the vaccine. So it's a bit of an issue, right, for vaccine efficacy. But this is not yes. an issue with COVID. Yes. And the funny thing is, is when we went to hear some evolution guy that Ian sponsored, remember we went to the big auditorium Mm -hmm. across the street and then Ian like came out and you started talking about it and I and he said something or other and I was like oh it's just like dengue and original sin he didn't really like that remember that but I what do. what 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 is the moral of the story I was right again Amy was right <laughs> um 
but I do like the, the term original antigenic sin. It's good. Maybe if you're not I Catholic, think that's you fine. Don't, if, you're, if you're not Catholic, you don't know about it, right? Is that I a Catholic that's thing? Fine. Do you know? Yeah. Okay. Kang says, do boosters reduce the response time to reactivate memory cells? Do they stimulate B cells to make higher affinity antibodies? Yeah, so but that doesn't, that doesn't, that has no role in the timing of recalling memory. No, but it does stimulate B cells to make higher affinity antibodies. So by yeah, the way. Yeah, that doesn't affect recall. No. Uh, for the next two two days, Thursday and Friday, so Thursday is immune. We have Gabriel Victoria, who is a B cell expert. And Friday, we have John Udell, who is also and then a, Tuesday. an antibody expert. And Tuesday, we have uh, John Marcola from the VRC. The head of the VRC, right. Have you seen the data from Oxford that showed higher rates of myocarditis from mRNA vaccination for under 40? Does this suggest spacing out the dosage for that group? I've not seen that. I haven't seen those data. I mean, the, the, the mRNA vaccines were associated with a low rate of, of uh, myocarditis, right? I don't know, because the one that the CDC put on alert is not an mRNA-based vaccine. It's the adenovirus by Johnson & Johnson. You'd have to ask Daniel. All right. I, don't know. I don't know. I saw somewhere that zoos are trying to limit contact between animals and people. Do zoo animals really represent a threat of spillover? I think they want to protect the zoo animals because they're rare and precious, right? I like, would think so. Like gorillas, non-human primates. They're quite precious and rare, and we don't want them to die. And that's why the San Diego Zoo uh, vaccinated their gorillas. You should go back and listen to that twiv. It was good from the from the vet, the head vet at the San Diego Zoo. But also, you know, some of them are almost extinct, like the white rhino and some of the cats and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And Harry makes the statement of the year, we're getting masks and rapid tests two years after we needed them. Yep. Well, Did you know you could get free uh, rapid at home tests, Amy, from the U.S. government? Yeah, you go to the website and you register, just like you can now get free N95s if you go to the pharmacy. Are you... I think better late than never. It's good. I think, unfortunately, uh, it will be taken as he's been unable to control the pandemic, so now he's resorting to X, Y, and Z. Yeah, of course. And I think that um, it shows that um, we were completely unprepared and we need to reassess what our priorities are. Does the army really need 60,000 toilets in storage or do we need a few more NK-95s? Uh, in Virology Live, you said the only vax that 100% protects against infection is HPV. Curious, what does that mean for viruses like Hep A, B, C? They're not 100%. Well, we don't have a Hep C vaccine, right? No. The woman at the... FDA is trying to uh, generate one. Right. So, yeah, they, they allow infection, but they prevent disease. Exactly right. All right, Dr. Raul, TWIV 810 paper says that after seven or eight mutations at approximately two mutations per month of the variant, it declines. So three to four months between VOCs. This is baloney. Don't you think that's baloney, Amy? Yeah. He's just dreaming. Gosh, I, don't, I just don't get it. I don't know, but I wish they would dream some money my way. Well, the money is different from baloney. Yeah, I understand, but one is more useful than the other. I don't like baloney. I hear you're writing a grant, Amy. I am. Well, then you'll get money, yeah. right? I don't know. That was the philosophy the first time I wrote the grant. Didn't? Did you see any money? No, I didn't. But we've seen okay. some money. We've seen some. Yeah, well, not the amount that I need. Understood. Right? Okay, is it possible cross immunity from exposure to COVID-2 recent ancestor can partly explain why Southeast Asian countries fared better than the West? I, I doubt I don't that really much. understand that question. 
So say there are ancestors of SARS-CoV-2 circulating in those countries. Could they have given some partial cross-protective immunity? We've not been able to detect any, by sero surveys, we've not been able to detect any immunity that any of those people had. So yeah, I don't know what we're talking about. Well, it's unlikely. I would say it's unlikely because, yeah, as Amy said, they've looked back and they don't find any sero uh, reactivity and there would be some cross-reactivity. Uh, why is the term breakthrough infection being used since these vaccines don't provide sterilizing immunity? Isn't it expected in a normal part of the process? Yes, because antibody levels contract. Uh, but breakthrough has been used before, unfortunately. And um, uh, so it's here to stay. And I agree that it's not the right term because if you expect to be infected after being vaccinated, then it's not a breakthrough, right? But we have it. We're stuck with it. Would, would I be interested in full computer-generated transcripts of your lectures, podcasts, Q&As? It speeds up looking into up info. So uh, I know that YouTube will make a, a transcript, right? It does. You can turn on um, transcript, and it will make it, and you can copy and paste it. I mean, I haven't done anything with that because I'd have to go through and correct things, and I just don't have the time to do that. But if that's what you're talking about, it's there, right? Not my lectures, of course. Although, yes, those are on. I don't now. I, I think any video on YouTube can be transcribed. Is that correct? Correct me if I'm wrong. Boosters may weaken the immune system, says the European Medicines Agency. T cell exhaustion. Oh, that's the same thing as before. No. No T cell exhaustion. What sort of mutation would, uh, if any, would allow <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 to transmit via fomites? Who knows? Who knows? Right, Amy? Oh, you want me to predict? I got an envelope here. Uh, that's only for certain kinds of predictions. When you get the ball with the black cloth and, you know, you do some rubbing and it turns cloudy and gray, then we'll, we'll do some predicting. But I don't think we ordered the right ball yet. Uh, I have never seen a virus change its mode of transmission like that. I think it's highly unlikely, and I don't care no. to speculate. Would it be safe to send my unvaccinated four-year-old to school during such high rates of spread of COVID in the community? Is he masked? Are the teachers vaccinated? Yeah, if they were, say, Amy, masked and vaccinated, then what would you say? Might be okay if he's ma if he's vaccinated if he's masked also. Depends on yeah. how long he's there for, what type of mask, and very the ventilation system of the school, and various other things. Thoughts on Hong Kong culling thousands of hamsters due to COVID? Do you know anything about this, Amy? No. Why would they do that? Well, not only that, but hamsters are used as a, mo a model. So I don't understand why you, you would do that at all. Hong Kong's hamster call is excessive, say experts. 2,000 small family pets to be put down. Oh, so they're collecting people's pet hamsters, rabbits, and chinchillas. In That's relationship really to SARS-CoV-2? Yeah. I'm not sure that they're all uh, able to be infected. I think no, there's yes. significant genetic differences between a Syrian golden hamster and the hamster that you buy in the pet store. Yeah, I think that's uh, uh, draconian. Let's put it that way. Yes, draconian. I say, well, they want me to put a link to your paper in the show notes. Okay, I will do that. Not what the paper? chat. The paper that you published this week. Why would you put a link into it if you're going to discuss it on TWIP? Well, it was someone if you're not it. going to discuss it on TWIP, then fine. No, I am going to discuss it? it, but someone wants it now. Now! <laughs> they want it now, Amy. Well, then tell them to just go to mbio.org and download it. That's what I told Jonathan. Okay. Whatever. Do whatever you want. 
What are your thoughts on the world vaccination will stop variants narrative? I would expect to get antigenic drift anyway, like the other human coronaviruses. What do you think about that, Amy? It will be it will be much slower if you reduce the the reproductive rate of the virus, right? Mm-hmm. The amount of reproduction of the virus in people it will it will be much slower for antigenic drift. But we don't seem to care about vaccinating the world, or not that much. Well, I mean, I mean, yeah. So if we vaccinate most people, you would cut down on reproduction, but we're not. We're not going to do it. But it is correct. It would cut down on transmission and it would cut down on reproduction. Everybody says yep. you look great in red. And Elizabeth wants to know if we're going to do the paper on a twiv. Yes, we will. We will have Amy on and she will explain to us the um, significance of it, right? Yeah, after the after the seventh. So Victor says, WHO Chief Scientist Sumya Swaminathan said, there is no evidence right now that healthy children or healthy adolescents need boosters. No evidence at all. Well, maybe the pub, maybe PubMed doesn't work in her office. I'm trying to think. So the, the evidence for... Well, so first of all, the the fact for kids, especially under five, that's how they're going to fix the vaccine, right? That's what Pfizer's plan is. Is the first two you didn't really get a good antibody response if you got any at all, and so their plan is to go and give a third shot. You had to off it on off it said this on slap it blah blah blah. So right then and there, obviously, the internet is not working at the lady's office. And I believe that anybody over five, the CDC or the FDA has already agreed to boosting. Right. Because they were vaccinated according to the same schedule as adults at three weeks, three to four weeks, which then corrects the breath according to you. So again, I don't think the internet is working properly in her office. She might want to call IT. Well, otherwise, how else is she going to fix it? I understand. Uh, maybe he or she is not uh, interpreting the data properly. Uh, okay. Well, I was being nicer than that. I was blaming it on a technological okay. problem, not the fact that she could not read the paper and understand what they say. Uh, what are your top three unknowns about viruses that puzzle you? You can go ahead. <laughs> My top three unknowns. Uh, I want to know why some viruses are not transmitted well in their host, in their hosts, and others are transmitted very well. I don't understand the basis for that. You're next. Um, it's interesting. I don't understand. Um why they think it's why they cause sec, why they cause disease at secondary sites of infection and can kill the host because it doesn't seem to make very much sense why would you want to be virulent i would like to know how coronaviruses package their genome and not cellular rnas i think it's pretty clear no it's there's no data on it you can't question my my my. Uh, no, I just think that the, uh, I think that I think we don't we don't actually understand what VPG does. Yeah, it's fair. And enough. I think and I think that we've focused on the idea that VPG has needs to be removed for translation, which is not correct, and we haven't really focused on what VPG actually does for assembly because those experiments are much harder. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because the capsid, the pentamers and the 14S all form close to where the replication complex is, right? Correct. Correct. Yes. So you can imagine that VPG is needed to orient the replicate, the, mm-hmm. these protomers appropriately. And because it's, they're so small inside and VPG, 
the virus genome then wraps around the end termini of all the VPs that are inside the capsid, there's not a lot of room left for RNA. Any RNA okay. that's okay. excessive gets pushed out, right? You can imagine that that could be a mechanism. And it seems to be that in some cases where we're able to see inside the particle, we do see the RNA wrapped around the end termini, like the recent Rhino 14 paper, where I came to you and I said, look, it's just like histones, just like what I talked to Raul about five years ago. Remember? Ian writes, do you and Amy get frustrated with the reverence given to anything an MD says, however misguided, incorrect, or just BS? Is he living my life? <laughs> well, the thing is, yeah, most, I, I don't know, most people think that MDs know everything, right? They're deified. Uh, including science, which, look, look, I'm not a cardiologist. I wouldn't tell you anything about your heart, except that it beats. And um, cardiologists shouldn't talk about viruses unless they work on them. But um, I don't get, Amy gets very frustrated. I have learned that that's the way it is. It's not changing. Oh, you still get frustrated. You can't tell them what goes on in our lab. Okay, I won't tell them. Dr. Campbell and Dr. Gottlieb seem to think we will be entering the endemic stage now. Two virology experts, Amy. Really? Where'd they get their virology degrees? Not with you, that's for sure. Well, maybe they went to, like, I don't know, biovirologydegree.com. It's already endemic. It's here. It's here. That's endemic. <laughs> Violet. Right. I mean, I think that they don't, uh, that they're using the word in a different fashion. So to be a pandemic, you have to be endemic, right? And a pandemic is just defined by the number of cases. And we're not quite at the ability to control the number of cases. So it, it cannot really be endemic, right? I understand by the by the definition that they're using, right? That there is going to be some control about a number of cases that we can deal with, right? Sure. Uh, thank you, Violet, for your support. I have a friend who's trying to talk me out of vaccinating my two-year-old in reference, Doctor Monroe. Can you give me some response talking? I, well, first of all, how do you vaccinate a two-year-old that's not approved at that age, right, Amy? No, it's not approved. So I think maybe she just means in general. Well, the thing is, is that you should vaccinate your two year old in general, right? Against polio, measles, <clears throat> sure, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, all of those diseases that were our childhood lethalities. I think you should tell your friend that Dr. Monroe is spewing nonsense. Uh, it's it's all misinformation. And Dr. Monroe clearly gets paid to do that as many anti-vaxxers get paid to do that. But yes, ch children are healthier when they don't get infectious diseases. Cost society much less too. So if you wanted to like, just look at it as an economic thing, it will cost your family and society a much lower economic burden if you vaccinate. So Mark's friend is positive and has diarrhea. How does that happen since this is a respiratory virus? Uh, there is some there is some virus that you cough up and swallow and goes through the gut and can trigger cytokines and various other things to lead to diarrhea. I wonder if this enterovirus study involves acute flaccid paralysis. Scares me with small children. Does it involve acute flaccid paralysis, Amy? Yes. It involves the viruses that are associated with the development of AFM. Yes. That's what yes. we like. Well, look, we just hit a thousand people. Oh, then we went to nine ninety seven. It's like a dynamic Thanks. thing. People yeah, come and I'm go. sure we'll get a thousand and be more by the end of the two hours. Look, now you're at a thousand and one. It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll all be good. Discussion only seems to center on human transmission of COVID nineteen, but little talk of the number of animal species infected in the well truth or dare that's because there's not a lot of study right very few animals have been sampled and we have l little understanding of the pool of viruses that's in them so that's why you could speculate but that's not useful no Would you, you say, have to sample you have to put in money and sample it uh, 
There's any data on vaccinated folks who contract COVID having any long-term issue? Well, Daniel says that they do, there are some, but the number is low. And I forgot the percent that he quoted. It was like almost one in a million, one in a hundred thousand, somewhere around there, which is basically the same number of people who like developed VAP. It was on par with the people who developed VAP. That what, number. what makes a vaccine induce sterilizing immunity? You must have a viremic phase to the viral, to the virus, in order to get sterilizing immunity. If you don't have a viremic phase, no. What about HPV? Might be one of the. It's the only one, but it. it we don't really understand how it works. <clears throat> Is that cashmere, Amy? Yes. Everything is cashmere, even my socks. It's cold out there. So Marina went to a non-mask crowded wake, was in line for 30 minutes, double mask to have one Pfizer dose. What are my chances of infection? Zero. It is not zero, maybe low. How's that, Amy? Low is not sufficient. Okay. It's probably really, really low. I mean, it doesn't... So yes, ideally they should all be wearing a mask, but if you're double masked, it's probably not, you know, going to go through. Can different families of respiratory viruses displace each other? We've almost no cases of flu A here right now during this COVID-2 outbreak. Usually flu is rampant this year. It's time no, they're year. not displacing each other. It's because we're physically distancing and masking. We have physical interventions to prevent the transmission. Thank you, Calix Yukon, for your contribution. If you could collect enough of a virus to hold in your hand, <laughs> what you imagine it would look and feel like? Would it have a scent? No scent. It would be sturdy. I think it would be liquid, no? No, I think if I if you stack a particles on top of particles, I don't think there's any liquid. No, it wouldn't feel fluid at all? Would it no, feel if, like, you, uh, if you put... Entero has got to be pretty sturdy. Would it feel like peanut butter? No. In your hand? I don't think so. Like a bagel? A bialy? No, they're kind of soft. Like Maybe. salmon? How it would feel like salmon, you think? No, that's too squishy. <laughs> that's a good question. I like that. It makes you kind of get creative, right? Yeah, I think that enteros are pretty sturdy. I don't think that they're going to be squ that squishy. Chinese government use a CT of 40 as the threshold for Olympic athletes in Beijing. Oh, that's way too high. Way too high. 30. That's because Daniel says 30. There's, that's because 40, you're amplifying crack. 40, there's no infectious virus. There's no reason to, do any, to set CT 40. It has to be 30. Between 30 and 40, there's very, very little infectious virus. It's ignoring the science. Ooh, a lot of repetition. Did you see the paper on weed in SARS-CoV-2? I didn't see it. I'm sorry. Did you see it, Amy? Seriously? <laughs> we. No, I mean, I know about this paper, but you really seriously think I'm going to read this piece of crap? Well, I know. Where did it, where I have did it a get grant published? to write. Where did it get published? Some ridiculous. I don't think it's been pu fully published. I have a grant, right? I don't have time to waste with ridiculousness. All right. I I just was curious because you uh, usually read uh, most of the papers out there. I know, but this one was like so ludicrous. It was like ridiculous. I don't have time right now. Is there a test that will show if an individual made a robust immune response to one of the vaccines? Sure, you can get an antibody test, except what are you going to do with the number? What is the yeah, number right. going to tell you? We don't know how to interpret the number. Yep, it's absolutely right. You could get it. So why do I want to do this? We don't. It's just If you have an extra $100, send it my way. My lab needs more money. <laughs> what do you think about England dropping COVID restrictions? I'm okay. all for it. I think it's great. They, va they have vaccines that work. And that's it. The pandemic should be over in countries that have enough vaccine for everyone. 
if people have chosen not to be vaccinated. Now, the exceptions are young kids. You have to protect them. It may be very old people, but uh, it should be over. Right, very old people are, are, are vaccinated if they're smart. I mean, here, like when they came out and they said like 70% of the population or some number over 50% of the population was vaccinated, there's no possible way that that math is correct. Because 85% of the highest vaccinated of the group that's the highest is the highest vaccinated, and that's 60%, 65 and over. And then everybody else thinks that they're basically immune to the virus because you don't really get such severe disease. So it dramatically decreases. And it's not like, you know, if you went from 50 50 to 65, it just went down 5%. It goes down to like 40% that's vaccinated. And then when you include the fact that only 15% of kids over t- five are vaccinated, there's no possible way that they're most, that at least here, that we're in the majority of vaccinated people. It doesn't make any sense. The numbers don't add up. All right. So Celtic Tiger's dad has uh, just out of the hospital, had pneumonia. I heard asthma is not a comorbidity for COVID. So according to the CDC, moderate to severe asthma or people are more likely to be hospitalized with covid yes so, but it's not officially a comorbidity okay is really the, the largest comorbidity that they're concerned about and only concerned about are those people who are obese not diabetes either not as sub, it, it doesn't it, they're not as concerned about all of those people as they are about the obese okay they're not even that concerned about the immunocompromised because you're not immunocompromised for both B and T cells. So like for instance, my parents who have B cell deficiencies, they're highly protected because of the T cells and vice versa. Is the cytokine storm the primary cause of physical symptoms from COVID-19? Probably. I think cytokines and other immune responses will com- will collaborate most likely, but storming is a big part of it, yeah. Especially severe COVID, yeah. Are there any examples of viral zoonotic spillover events that only resulted in benign infections in humans? Ah, uh, let's see. So most of our viruses that we have came from animals at one point um, what they were like initially when they first spilled over we don't know many of them are benign right now really uh, yeah like the pep the uh, polyomaviruses that infect all of us are quite benign but i don't know what they were on day one right when they came from yeah whatever. but they still have a disease associated with them no they don't unless you're immunosuppressed amy can you think of any Spill over recently in recent history where the virus is benign in humans? No. I can't think of any. No. 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 Let's see. Do protein subunit vaccines tend to be more immunogenic than inactivated whole virus vaccines if the same adjuvant is used? I don't know how you compare. Because, like, so for, like, polio, we don't have a subunit vaccine, right? And for the ones that we have subunit vaccines, we don't really have inactivated vaccines. See, the problem is you'd have to compare the same virus, different vaccines of the same virus, right? Wouldn't That's what fair? I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. We don't have that, right? So... And even if we had a, even if we had an inactivated vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, like the ones in China and other places, we we don't have a subunit vaccine. And also, um, influenza is available as inactivated and protein subunit, but they're both poorly immunogenic. So that doesn't. So I don't know why you think they might be more immunogenic. Uh, so I can't wear my TWIV mask on campus, no. You can't on Columbia's campus, apparently not. Sorry. No. 
Thank you, Tom, for your support. Very much appreciated. If pregnant in the first trimester with only the first dose of Pfizer, what's better, take the second shot now or wait till the third trimester to pass the antibodies to the infant? What do you think, Amy? Well, it depends on when in the second trimester because you could get the boost at the end of the third, at the towards the end of the third trimester, right, before you deliver, right? Yeah. So I think it depends on when, what the timing is. I'm just, I'm not sure about the, the third trimester. Um, Cause I remember a study we did on TWIB where they said, if you'd go too late, then there's not enough time to get sufficient antibodies over to the baby. But you might also be able to compensate that if they're not f via that way, then they're via breast milk. So, I mean, I think second trimester is probably the way to go, if I remember that paper. Do you remember that, Amy? Yeah, I do. But I think, as I said, I think it would depend on the timing of when you're talking about. All right. My husband is on day nine since COVID, now fully recovered, but continues to test positive on rapid antigen, triple vax. Is he still posing a risk to family? No. No, not, not at day nine. Most of the shedding is over by then. All right. It's 8.51, so I'll go to 9 o'clock, and then I have to go because I have to do some reading. So somebody said that Novavax is a protein subunit vaccine, but it's not licensed. So what is the what, – what can I say about it? Yeah, we don't know what anything about it. What can you say about it? About it? We no. have no idea. Yeah, no, we don't we – we don't have – I mean – we can't compare it to the inactivated. We don't have a lot of data on that. And you couldn't do a one-off that way. It would have to have a. You would have to do a really careful, controlled experiment. Uh, what was the what was the question here? Um, does the infectiousness vary depending on whether or not you have developed disease from infection? No. What? So your infectiousness for someone else does that depend whether you have disease or not? No. I mean, that's the big deal about COVID is that you get a lot of asymptomatic transmission. People don't know they're infected and they're transmitting, at least early in the outbreak. Even still. Does boosting after initial doses for low-risk individuals move the needle enough to justify the mandate? I don't know what a low-risk individual. I know no comorbidities, young. But, you know, if I were them... Yeah, I, it actually does. There was a paper that I sent you and Daniel that did that talked about this. What did it say? That it justifies the booster or whatever, justifies the immunization yeah. of young people. Okay. I don't remember. I don't know. It may be, have been today, may have been tomorrow, yesterday, may have been two weeks ago. I don't know. You have to go through your taxes to find it. Or just ask Daniel. He probably will know what one I'm talking about. Have you either of you ever handled really dangerous viruses? Did it freak you out? I never have. Polio is about the most dangerous I have handled. And since we have vaccines, it's not really that dangerous. What about you, Amy? Uh, I've played with samples that have SARS-CoV-2. More dangerous sure than polio, right? Sure, we can go with that. Uh, Vanity says, I just learned about hybridomas. Are they still used for creating monoclonals? Yes. Are you using them, Amy? Yes. I'm generating them. Yes. Amy is... Uh... <clears throat> I'm doing a lot of things. I do. I make hybridomas. I look at antibodies in various different ways, right? Indeed. I multitask. What is all this typing? I sent you a text message. Oh. Okay. Do we, do we know how much infection occurs in various transports? In Melbourne, tram windows are part open even with air conditioning. No carbon dioxide meter studies yet. You know of any quantification of transmission like on buses or uh, trains and that sort of thing? Maybe they were done early on. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I'm not really familiar with it. 
Certainly, if the windows open, that helps, right, circulate the air and so forth. Well, wasn't that the whole scandal about the people in Israel at the beginning of the pandemic when they opened schools, they didn't open all the windows and turned off all the air conditioning or something? That's right. That's absolutely right. If I had a scratchy throat, really fatigued, without congestion, tested negative, what virus do you think it is to blame? I don't know. There's 160 different rhinos. There's 110 different enteros. Some of them are respiratory. Then there's flu. Then there's adeno. Then there's RSV and metanomonia virus and parainfluenza and viruses that we don't even know about, plus the four common colds, coronaviruses. I don't know. Pick a one that you yeah. like the name of and call it a day. There you go. Veveran Sasquatch, thank you so much for your contribution, the support of the incubator. By the way, I was there today. I interviewed David Moleski, who painted Ebola. And if you don't know what that is, go check out the last twiv. It was my pick. And I talk, talked with him about uh, how, his painting. It was really cool. Is Eastern equine encephalitis mosquito disease something to overly worry about? I would say not overly because the highest cases are only in certain parts of the country, and you can readily protect yourself against mosquitoes. So I would not becoming overly... more frequent. Pardon me? I think it's becoming more frequent. It is, but you can protect yourself against mosquitoes. I understand. Four more minutes. It's 8.56. Alberta Public Health has data showing vaccinated 80-plus-year-olds are hospitalized less frequently than unvaccinated 18 to 29-year-olds. Sounds about right. That sounds right. Vaccination works. What do you think of recent preprints saying Omicron has lost its fear in cleavage site and enters cells by endocytosis, not by fusion? So I have that in the TWIV uh, queue, except we have a bunch of uh, guests coming up. But here's the thing. They're all done in cells and culture, and it's not clear if that happens in people. In your upper tract, lower tract, it's not clear if the entry happens that way, right? Could be a cell culture artifact. Right. It really has lost its cleav fear and cleavage site, or it's just inefficiently cleaved by yeah, It's fear. inefficient. It's not lost. It's just okay. slightly altered, yeah. Oh, I could put cloth over no, Columbia would see the cloth mask and they would say, no, I could put the surgical over the cloth, right? But I'm just going to wear a surgical mask. It's fine. Uh, have you been wearing surgical? You always did wear surgical masks, right, Amy? Okay. Yeah. Cloth masks do not fit my face. Amy, how do you think the pandemic will play out after Omicron? Several years of declining seasonal waves, more immune evasion, fizzle out. What do you think, Amy? Uh, I think that we'll get more, we'll get a few more waves and it will probably be able to be controlled by the winter of 2023. So we can start 2024 with, uh, the ability to say that we can control it with one in a hundred thousand. So that makes it five years, right? Well, less more of along the four year line, but. I don't mind being wrong. I mean, but at the rate we're going, where, you know, mm. you can never, you know, what makes you think that until we convince more of the unvaccinated to get vaccinated, that we're not going to have additional variants that cause people to get out of control? That's absolutely right. Thank you, Pamela, for your contribution to the incubator in New York City. Any idea why people who get tinnitus from COVID recover while those who get tinnitus from the vaccine still have issues? No I idea. No idea. I think nobody knows. I'm not sure it's the same route at all. It's different, right? So no idea. I don't know. Thank you, Hayden, for your contribution. Can you please point me to the study for evidence on no booster required after two doses in COVID? I just sent you the New England Journal of Medicine or the JAMA paper in a tax. On this, on this issue? Yeah. Let's see. Maybe I could give him the um, 
the link here. And who are you again? Amy Rosenfeld? Yeah. Oh, you, you well, sent it to me and Daniel, right? Yeah. Okay. I thought that was a paper we had done on um, Twitter. Well, oh, this one was the newest one. Here we go. Effectiveness of booster against COVID-related symptoms and hospitalization in England and nature. Is that it? That's one of them, yeah. But there's also a paper. I highlighted it. Hold a second. Then I have to go because it's 9 o'clock. Then there's one here that says vaccination of previously infected individuals does not provide additional protection for several months, but after that provides significant protection, at least against symptomatic COVID. Does that sound right? That's part, that's part of it, yeah. There were two of them basically say so you don't need to get boosted. You don't need a vaccine. Oh, here we go. Necessity of COVID vaccination in persons who have already had COVID. Vaccination of previously infected immunity does not provide protection for several months, but after that, it provides significant protection. Okay, so that's um, JAMA. Um, yeah, whatever, one of these medical journals. So the, the, the title is Necessity of COVID Vaccination in Persons Who Have Already Had COVID. So you can search on that because I don't have a, a good way of uh, getting that. Okay, Amy, thank you so much. All right. Tomorrow we're working on the grant, so be mm -hmm. prepared for stress. We all know that this is my favorite time. All right. Thank <laughs> Lack you, Amy. of patience. Bye -bye. All right. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye bye. All right. Let's get through the next hour here. How does that sound? Sounds like the most difficult lab technique to learn is how to get grants. Yes, it is very difficult to get grants to support your research. And, and, you know, you would think that scientists would get grants because what they do is helping people, right, for the most part. But you have to compete. I guess it's fine because you have to weed out the, uh, the ones that aren't so good, the applications that aren't so good. But it gets more and more competitive because... A lot of people are entering the field, and it's it's just very hard, and the review process doesn't work well, and it's it's really a chore. It's amazing that things get done, frankly. The problem, one of the problems is that big labs get bigger and bigger, and they take more and more of the money, and they're not necessarily more productive. But yes, it is absolutely correct that uh, it's really hard. To get funded, Mark, uh, confirming we don't believe the virus actually enters the brain. Yes, that's correct. The, the neurological symptoms are, according to the neurologist from Columbia that we had on TWIV some time ago, hypoxia, cytokines. No direct effect of virus reproduction. Can you comment on the latest Twitter view from Peter Hotez on what will happen next? Essentially, endless variants, some being worse to come. He thinks there's no longer a chance for lasting immunity. So Peter is wrong. He doesn't understand immunity. He doesn't understand what's happening because we are already immune to severe disease. Doesn't he get that? We don't care about infection. As long as most people are vaccinated, you don't care about infection. If you're not vaccinated, you'll be infected and you'll get some kind of immunity anyway. I shouldn't say he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's not nice. But I, so this Twitter business, I was on Twitter ages ago and my scientist colleagues used to say, what are you doing that for? It's useless. It's a waste of time. And now they're all flocking to it because they get a lot of attention when they say stuff. So I would say, beware of what you hear on Twitter. <laughs> um, there, there is not going to be an endless chain of variants. If there are, AKA influenza virus, well, I don't think it's going to be the same because with influenza, the variants in some cases lead to higher uh, fractions of severe disease. And we are not seeing that with a whole host of variants of SARS-CoV-2, right? So I don't see why this should change. If you can get population immunity, 
you can cut down on circulation and the number of variants will decrease. Now, how long that immunity lasts, I don't know. It's not going to be 40 years like polio. These respiratory, these mucosal pathogens, immunity is not 40 years. It is 10 at best. So I'm not sure what we will do, but my feeling is once most of the world is either vaccinated or infected, then we're going to see almost all mild disease, sniffles and colds, and you won't even need to vaccinate anymore. And so there, the population will be immune. The problem with SARS-CoV-2 is it entered a completely immune, naive population, including older people who had no immunity, killed a lot of them. And now most of us are going to be immune at some point. So I don't think we're going to need a vaccine for more than five years. That's my view, but I don't put it on Twitter. I just tell you folks, and I put it on Twiv. Because on Twitter, well, what's the point? I don't, I, I don't participate in the Twitterverse. Thank you, Mary. Appreciate your contribution to the incubator. I think I saw Mickey sneeze once. Mouse, mice don't sneeze or cough. In fact, James Lee, thank you for your contribution. I don't mean to impugn MDs, but when MDs get on the airwaves and profess to know things that they don't, then it's a problem, right? That shouldn't happen. Really appreciated the last two about the Danish study. Wish we could have that kind of monitoring information available at a much larger scale. Yeah, so the, the Danish study, which you know, was able to compare Delta and Omicron because they were occurring during the transition period from Delta to Omicron, they had infections by both. So they could say in households with no vaccination, two doses or three, uh, how were they spread? And um, that for that, you need a good health monitoring system, which many countries do not have. Unfortunately, we certainly don't have it here. But I thought that was a great study. I would like to see um, it, it done elsewhere. That would be great. But I don't think we're going to see that. What is immune evasion? So Immune evasion is when a virus changes to circumvent some kind of immunity. So it could be antibodies. So as you know, if you get vaccinated, your blood contains antibodies that can uh, attach to the virus and block it from infecting cells. A variant can arise that has amino acid changes, say, in the spike protein. And then the, ant the same antibodies will not block uh, infection of cells. So that's evading antibodies. Uh, you could also evade other, evade other aspects of the immune system, which other viruses do in different ways. But that's one example of evasion. So Omicron evades antibodies. But you still don't get more disease from Omicron because probably the T cells are taking care of the, the virus is not evading T cells. It cannot evade T cells. So what might be the mechanism... Oh, I, I think that it simply has so many changes in the spike that uh, antibodies that would normally block infection are no longer able to do so. And so we report that in terms of neutralizing activity of the antibodies. And Omicron is highly resistant to neutralizing antibodies, whether they're made by infection or vaccination. So that's how the, the amino change, acid changes in the spike of Omicron mediate uh, evasion of antibodies. It's quite clear. And that is why it transmits well in populations. It's not because it's inherently more transmissible. It transmits better. It, it, say the secondary attack rate in a household is higher for Omicron um, compared to Delta because of immune evasion, which makes sense because if the virus can reproduce in the, in the face of immunity, it will be able to infect more people. Now, the... The key is to understand that it's not giving you more disease. It is infecting very efficiently, but it's not making people sicker. And it's the same as Delta. So it's good. The vaccines are working. I thought I said there was something down with the South... African data. Yeah, they admitted in their paper, their preprint, they say these, they compared hospitalization and, and severe disease 
Omicron to Delta, right? So the Delta is historical data, and the Omicron is current. And they like said Omicron seems to be causing fewer hospitalizations. The problem is that more people are vaccinated now than with Delta. They're younger. They have fewer comorbidities. All of those things would make disease less severe. So you cannot conclude it's the virus. Do you understand? And this is a problem with observational studies. Unless you look at the patient population very clearly, you're going to get fooled. And they admitted it, and Daniel agreed. He says, Daniel says, I see unvaccinated people getting just as sick with Omicron as with Delta and previous variants. So this is not an inherently mild virus. It has different outcomes because you're vaccinated or you're younger. South Africa, most of the population getting infected was younger. Fewer comorbidities, okay? That's a really important point. Is there a good chance that next fall there will be another dangerous variant that can cause more lock? Now, now why do you say dangerous, Tony? Tony Lucisano, why are you calling it dangerous? We handled Delta, Omicron, and all the ones before with the vaccines. Their effectiveness against severe disease has been the same. So I don't know what you mean by dangerous. We will have variants um, as long as so many people are infected, right? Let's get more people vaccinated. Let's Well, many people are being infected, but even at you know half a million a day in the U.S., it takes a long time to get through the 100 million plus that are still unvaccinated. <laughs> Hotez says variants will get worse. He thinks there will not be long lasting immunity. T cells are not being killed from infection. This is not HIV. Uh, the T cells are there, but their memory may not last forever. As I said, five, maybe. 10 years at the most. But as I said, we're not going to need vaccine. We're going to get yearly infections that are going to be very mild, and that's going to boost us every year. Okay? That's the key. You need boosters if only to save life and reduce hospital overflow. No, the boosters are not doing that. The, there is already two doses already protects against hospitalization and death. The booster is to correct giving the first two doses too close together. But the, even that protects you very well against severe disease. The boosters uh, are needed to prevent infection because they think now the vaccine should be preventing infection, even though they weren't meant to do that. But that's not going to work long term because every six months you're going to need a new booster. Uh, what are your thoughts on the paper about EBV and multiple sclerosis? So I've, I've got my eyes on it. I haven't gone over it yet, but we're going to get to it for sure. Uh, my friend just tested positive because she knows I watch. She asked me what to do. She's boosted. No, she's going to be fine. Uh, no comorbidities. Yeah, there's nothing you can do. However, keep monitoring your symptoms. If they get severe, if they get worse seek medical care and maybe they will give you monoclonals. So if he's older and has comorbidities, they might want to give her monoclonals right away. Do you think in a few weeks metropolitan cities will be safer to non-COVID people due to greater herd immunity since they were so heavily hit? I think they're safe already because vaccines are used by a lot of people and they work. Now, are they safe for unvaccinated people? No. But you've made your choice, right? And I don't think it's fair to keep everyone else hostage. You think the vaccines will make the pandemic end faster than 1918? That's a great point because it took, took five years, essentially, for 1918 to burn out without vaccines. Um, but I think many more people died in 1918 and we're saving lives by vaccination. That's the difference, right? But the problem is that now we're seeing a lot of infections because we're testing more and the vaccines don't prevent infection. So people who are not really sick are, are turning up positive. That's adding to the numbers. But uh, 
I feel that the U.S., for example, should be getting back to normal. I don't think any of the restrictions or limitations are really needed because we have vaccines that work and uh, the people who choose not to take them have made their decision. Now, the problem is, of course, that they will overburden the healthcare system. And so that is in part why they are still masking uh, and distancing and so forth, because we don't want to get them infected to the extent that other people who need to go to hospitals can't do it. So it's a really tough situation, right? Very tough, very tough situation. You always say the T-cells are saving us, seeing lots of concern that T-cells may get depleted. No, no, this is a pure speculation. This is crap. There are memory cells. T-cells regenerate. This is crap. Naysayers, they want to get some attention by saying, oh, this is not going to work. I always say that they save us because they are saving us. I mean, if the Omicron is not neutralized by antibodies, then what do you think is saving us from severe disease and death? And uh, T-cells, maybe some other aspects of the immune system, maybe non-neutralizing antibodies. Yeah. Amy's point about how we travel more now really has to be understood. We as a species are almost just one single population now, scary. Yeah, I understand we travel, but, you know, in the old days, influenza could still get around the world when we didn't have airplanes. So I don't know what, obviously it plays a big role, but not the whole story. Uh, is there any chance you could have Robert Malone on? No, we do not want to provide a forum. We have a lot of listeners, and we don't want to dignify his uh, position by having him on TWIV. Not happening. I take it T-cell epitopes don't change much because there's no selective pressure. No, that's not the reason. So the, the T-cell epitopes change slightly, but not enough to make a difference. And there's no selection. That's correct because... The T cell epitopes are displayed on the surface of infected cells in MHC molecules, major histocompatibility molecules, and then the T cell receptor recognizes that peptide MHC complex. MHCs are polymorphic in the population. Like your MHC is probably different from mine. So if your T cell epitope, when you when you get infected with SARS-CoV-2, changes, and that virus then infected me that change would probably have no difference with respect to MHC binding. So there's no selection in a population. Where there is a selection is in, so at the population level, there is no selection for altered T-cell epitopes. However, in the individual level, on a chronic infection, there is an infection that goes on for years. So hepatitis C virus, HIV, many years of infection, you can have a series of T-cell variants emerging in you, and because your MHCs are all the same, that can have an impact and allow better reprodu reproduction. But that virus will not be, be better in someone else, so there is no selection. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, here in Australia, it was reduced, but should that be from the first or second dose? If I received my first dose in May, second in August, and booster in January... Well, it's supposed to be six months from the th from the second dose, right? Because the first and second, so let's see, you got your first in May, second in May, uh, June, July, August, three months. So it's better than three to four weeks, and then eight months uh, afterwards. I mean, that's an odd spacing. But if you had gotten three to four weeks, then I would save six months for the third dose. But you seem to have spaced out those first two doses. Uh, does the third vaccine also boost T cell uh, effect activity? So we asked that of uh, Alessandro Sete yesterday, and he said the studies are underway. He doesn't know yet. Good question, Squoister. All good questions. I haven't got the chance to edit that damn. I wanted to get it. I always like to get it up the day after, and I have had no time today to add. I'm having no time to edit tonight. I don't know what to do. Stephanie, thank you for your contribution. And uh, too bad Amy left. 
Yeah. But yes, it's, it's really great that you, you view her as a, a role model for your girls. Absolutely. It's terrific. What do you think about censoring qualified voices of dissent? Doctors, immunologists, virologists that question public health. I don't want to censor anyone. I, I don't think that's the way to go. I wish... I wish that we had a way to push reasonable viewpoints forward more than we do. So, you know, famous podcasters like Joe Rogan, you know, they get people on and they have a huge audience for them. And people think, millions of people think, hmm, this, uh, this is the way it is. And I have a more reasoned approach and I don't get that kind of exposure. Why? Because I don't generate clicks for Mr. Rogan and all the others who depend on engagement to make a living. Now, I do not depend on engagement to make a living. As I've said a billion times, I just want to teach you virology. And the more people, the better, because I think you'll understand the whole situation better if you do that. But I have a, you know, even though I have a lot of people listening, it's great. Look at this. We have th over 1,000 people. We have 106,000 subs on YouTube. Many downloads of the audio only. Still not much compared to Rogan and his ilk. So uh, I wish we could fix that. I wish truth would spread better, but it doesn't. Lies and misinformation, because they exaggerate the situation. Oh, we're going to die. We're going to have endless variants. It'll never be right. That sells news, right? And nothing I can do about that. So I don't want to censor anyone, no. T-cell exhaustion is exactly <laughs> what you think it means. And it does not happen for SARS-CoV-2. There's no evidence of it. But it does happen, say, in cancers. It happens in HIV AIDS where you're infected for many, many years. Uh, basically, you know, the T-cells are trying to kill the cancer. They're trying to kill the virus-infected cell. And they get exhausted. They stop. So there are natural mechanisms to turn off T-cell activity. And those kick into play. And that's where CAR T-cell therapy, checkpoint inhibition therapy, tries to reverse it, to wake up those T-cells. And as I said, there's no evidence that the um, it's, that COVID involves that at all. Which is not to say that we won't find it, but I doubt because people have been looking really hard or closely at T-cell responses. Should we have called the four-week second dose an emergency booster in the six-month the proper second dose? Maybe. That's a good way to look at it. But it's too late. It's too late to make a, any, any change in that, right? All right, so Gernit, this is exactly what Amy is saying and what she wrote about in her blog post. Uh, at virology.ws, last week she had a blog post about prudent testing. Um, and let me just show you guys post so that you uh, here we go <clears throat> test prudently by Amy Rosenfeld virology blog okay so I would go virology.ws and check it out and so if we did testing for viruses that were commonly immunized against measles polio influenza would you see a lot of positives uh, I'm not sure about measles and polio Although I, I suspect polio is here in the U.S., uh, but we don't see it because there's no paralysis because the vaccines work. Uh, certainly influenza, you'd see a lot more infections with influenza if you tested randomly asymptomatic people. And so I think that's the situation we're in now. We're testing with, there's no reason if you're fully vaccinated to be testing unless you want to protect someone else, okay? If you, want to, if you have a two-year-old, you want to protect them. That's fine, totally fine. For the vast majority of people, it's not the issue. Thank you for being... Well, I'm not sure we're the last bastions, but I appreciate that you like our science communication. I enjoyed Spillover. I was wondering, what are your favorite books? So I have Spillover here uh, on the shelf. Now, oh, I have to tell you... Um, let me see if I can find this video. YouTube prof 
And what do I search for to um, to find this video? Let's see. Um, it's called bookshelf, right? Zoom bookshelf. There you go. There it is. <laughs> My Zoom bookshelf. I can't get the thumbnail there, but I'll show you the uh, the, the link there. Um, here it is. So if you go to Zoom, sorry, go to YouTube and search for my Zoom bookshelf. I take you through some of the science books. So this is where I am right now, if you see this icon. And I went through what I have on the shelf here. And I would just look at that because it's it's what you want to know. And I go through the whole shelf. Yeah, but I have spillover here. I really like spillover. I have some other favorites at well, but as well. But you can look in that video for that. Well, Mark, I'm glad that you guys have all relied on us. We try and bring you information. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you appreciate it. Between this and our TWIVs, especially with Daniel, I think we're making inroads, although I just wish we'd reach more people. Does humidity over 70% in the home or outside cause the rise of COVID infection with masks and 2X? So I don't know the answer, but for influenza virus, Lower humidity is associated with greater in infection, greater transmission, because when humidity is higher, the droplets that you expel by breathing and talking and coughing uh, that contain virus, they absorb water and they fall to the ground faster. And so in lower humidity, they can travel further. So I would guess that for COVID, high humidity is not going to be a problem. But the studies haven't been done. I'm not understanding the PCR test I had. One on the 26th, which was negative. Another on the 29th, which was positive. The one on the 5th, negative. I, so I would say the one in the middle was a false positive because they're so it's so close to the others. It's not likely to uh, represent a real, a real positive. So Susan tells us that T-cell is commonly used with chronic infection, right? Cancer, as I said, and now long COVID, there's evidence for T-cell exhaustion. Okay. My wife wants me to shower after returning from shopping. Is that necessary? Also, businesses have to get sprayed with disinfectant if someone who works there... No, no. So this is all hygiene theater. Because you're exhaling. You're not infected. Come home from shopping. You're not infected. Just wash your hands. I don't think that your body is going to harbor enough virus to infect anyone. And so... There's very little evidence that environmental surfaces are, are efficient transmitters of infection. So, however, you need to keep your wife happy. So if she wants you to take a shower, she should probably take a shower just for her, for her right, mind, mind's sake or whatever you call it. Yep. You wrote Omicron is evasive. I listened to that twiv twice and don't understand. I'm so sorry. I feel that that is a failure on our part that um, you didn't understand. So basically, that's based on the Dutch study, the, sorry, the Danish study, where they looked at transmission of Delta and Omicron in households. And they found that the Transmission within households was, was higher for Omicron versus Delta, but the impact of second or third doses of vaccine was nothing. Didn't impact, it impacted Delta, but not Omicron. And so they said the increased transmission in a household is because the virus is evading your immunity produced by the vaccine. Now, none of those people got seriously ill. It's just talking about infection, PCR positive infections. So that's what it means. It's evading antibodies that would protect against uh, infection. Yeah, Linus Pauling claimed that vitamin C was cure to everything, but it's not the cure to everything. 
and it's not as he touted it. It's kind of an example of someone going awry, I think. Any update on the lab leak theory? There's no, it's not a theory. The theory you have some data for. There's no data to support that. It's a speculation by people who want to accuse and who don't understand that viruses come from nature. They don't come from labs. And we have plenty of evidence that it came from nature. Now, Rand Paul doesn't know what he's talking about with respect to lab, uh, potential lab origin. He doesn't understand that viruses are zoonotic. They come from other animals. So, I mean, we have to move on here. Unfortunately, this won't die until we have an ancestor, and we may not have it. It's tough. How long does PCR stay positive? Well, it could actually stay positive well beyond your transmitting. Of it. From the onset of symptoms, maybe seven days is the period when you're going to be able to transmit if you're unvaccinated. Shorter if you're vaccinated, if you transmit at all, because the levels are lower also, besides being fewer days transmitting. But PCR, you can be PCR positive for a long time. And the problem is that they run the cycles of the PCR all the way up to 40. And that's crazy because from above 30 cycles, you are finding RNA, but there's no infectious virus there. They've done the studies. There's very little correlation. In fact, that was one of the other papers we did on Friday uh, out, of, um, out of Switzerland. Very little correlation beyond CT30. So um, you, you can't get your CT value, but if you did, I'll bet you would have 35 or 40, right? So, and the, the common cold coronas are not going to give you a positive P PCR. This is specific for SARS-CoV-2, very high specificity. Uh, if Amy could get any project approved, what would it be? Well, her current project, which is embodied in that paper, she finds that if you, say, immunize mice with poliovirus, they make antibodies that neutralize polio, but also other enteroviruses and rhinovirus. So she wants to know uh, where the antibodies directed on the capsid of polio, of the other viruses. And that takes quite a bit of money to do that. And that's what she's trying to do. And I'm sure that's what she'd say she'd want funded. Thank you for your contribution, uh, Jerry. Is the measles vaccine sterilizing? A lot of vaccine-hesitant people seem to bring this up. Now, we'll bring it up in what context? Um, I, I was under the impression that it is not. In fact, I get answers, and uh, both answers, yes and no. So this is actually one of my research projects to do in my spare time. And since I don't have any spare time, it's... Not getting done. I want to go and look at the data for the measles vaccine. The problem is that was developed before PCR, so very difficult to check people like we can do now. We can just do PCR on vaccinated people and see if you're infected or not. I'm not sure the data exist. Deborah Friedman said, I met Pauling as a kid. He was completely insane. All the parents said to stay away from him. Well, sometimes a brilliant scientist uh, is, it seems a bit insane. Yeah. I've tested positive for antibodies. Can I delay the booster? I don't think so because just being positive isn't enough information. We, In fact, we don't know what the positive antibody means because we don't know what level it would be protective. So I would say go ahead and get your booster for sure. Is MS a reason not to get the vaccine? I, this was asked of um, Daniel Griffin at one point. He said, no, there's no contraindication to vaccination. Thank you, uh, Lou, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Uh, Amy said uh, one per 100,000, right? 
history books are full of horrible pandemics. You think there's a risk in modern times of a virus that spreads like SARS-CoV-2 with a 10% or worse fatality. Who knows, right? Um, the, the, the best transmitters often do not do that sort of Ebola-like killing. So I think for some reason there's a balance, and uh, I'm not sure where, what it is, but I think not. I can't rule it out, but I think not. When will Amy be on TWIV? Uh, so we she has to get her grant out. It's due February 5th. So it's sometime in February. She'll talk about her paper that, that I just showed you earlier. Thank you, Rob, for your contribution to the incubator. The incubator. Will every coronavirus have a somewhat different sequence from one another? Uh, would a single virus have the same sequence as another in the same host? No, actually, uh, we did a paper on that in on Twivo, and they show that there is quite a bit of intra-host variation. You can get different viruses from one host. A lot of them don't make it out, so you don't see it in other people. But uh, the chances are that if you isolate SARS-CoV-2 from different people, they'll be somewhat different, have at least a base difference. If, if, they're, if they're identical, that's uh, highly unusual, I think. But yes, within a host, you do see variation for sure. How common is it for viruses to cause long-term disease? Well, all the herpes viruses become latent. They infect you and give you a primary disease, and then you have re constant reactivations with all of them, herpes simplex 1 and 2. Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, uh, varicella zoster, HHV, 6, 7, and 8. They all do that. And, of course, hep C, hepatitis B virus, uh, HIV, HTLV. They all cause long-term disease. So there are quite a few. Yep. Is cases dropping really indicating less spread or an indicator with holidays over, less test, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, listen, transmission, as put so well in the Swiss paper, transmission is not just a property of the virus. And do you know what, folks? We've been saying this for over a year on this live stream. Transmission is not just about the virus. And if you see more transmission, it doesn't implicate, indict the virus. Human behavior is a big part of it. And Amy and I wrote a Times op-ed, largely ignored, saying that the biggest driver is likely human behavior, that the virus makes a contribution, but what it is, what that contribution is, really hard to find out by epidemiological studies. So yes, cases dropping could be due to people staying home or doing something different than the beginning of the outbreak. Absolutely. And that Swiss paper nailed it. I have to say, I'm really glad to see some other scientists picking this up because everyone else is on the other side of the transmission issue, getting tired of it. Wondering what you thought of schools like Hopkins mandating boosters and then subsequently mandating N95. So I don't think we need to be wearing masks. But again, if you're vaccinated, you're okay. But you're trying to protect unvaccinated people and keep them out of the hospital to protect the health care system. That is Tony Fauci's biggest concern, right? Preserving the health care system. So uh, I agree with that. I don't, I don't think we should be having these mask mandates in the U.S. right now. I think we have two vaccines that work and there's no need to have it. So that's what I think. Yeah, so the hamsters uh, is ridiculous. That's absurd. They, th there's no evidence that this is a threat of a reservoir at all. Crazy. Poor hamsters. If one measures virus in wastewater, levels have not fallen to summer 2021 levels. It might not get to that stage that the two of you want number of deaths that from influenza. It might be too pessimistic. Well, um Virus in, in wastewater is nucleic acid. It's not necessarily an indicator. I mean, it tells you what's around, but it's not an indicator of infectious virus. So I want to see 
as Amy said, the, the deaths per 100,000, was it, or infection, I think that's a better indicator. So I think you're being too pessimistic, yeah. Yeah, the CDC said we could take off our masks last May, and I think they should have left it at that. Then they got that bogus Provincetown report of high PCR levels in vaccinated people, which was meaningless because as the Swiss study showed last week, there is no correlation between PCR RNA levels and infectious virus. None. And so that was a bogus study and the CDC reversed itself on masks because of that and that was the beginning of the decline and we didn't we should still not be masking in my personal opinion we shouldn't be because we have vaccines that work Can you talk about what to say to a family that are nervous about the vaccine for children? Why are they nervous about it? What's the concern? Ask, ask them, what are you worried about? Uh, if, it's, if you're worried that it's a new technology, but it's been in millions and millions of people with very, very few issues, right? The mRNA vaccines with some myocarditis that is treatable, but less frequency than COVID causes myocarditis. And, you know, yeah, you're going to get pain at the injection site. You might get fever. You might get a headache. You might get worse, but you're not going to die, and it'll prevent you from getting sick. So there's really no downside. You shouldn't be afraid. Just look at all the people that have gotten them. That's what I would do. If I had young kids, I'd get them vaccinated for sure, knowing what I know, right? Listener pick with two podcasters picking apart Rogan and Malone was excellent. Yes. Um, I don't have time to pick apart Rogan and Malone. I'm glad they did it because I have another agenda. I want to give you good information, not say why that's bogus information. But so I'm, I'm really grateful that they did it. It was really good. When Daniel cited better results after the third vaccine for those who had primary Moderna, was that just the results of the longer gap between the first doses? I doubt it. I don't think so. I think there's a slight improvement, but I, as he said, it's really not worth uh, going for. I don't think it's it's um, going to make much of an impact. Well, of course, the president is going to say he's going to keep his health advisors. Um, I have already said many times, and Amy has as well, who we have issues with. Um, and so I don't want to repeat it again. We've seen many twice and thrice vaccinated adult males with heart attacks after asymptomatic exposure. I'm not sure where you're getting these data from, Okay. So I'm not commenting on it until I see the data. And that's a real problem to make comments on hearsay, which is what you're doing here. Hi, I'm a student in your virology course. I'm curious how it differs from virology live you finished <laughs> a few weeks ago. Well, you're taking it for credit. <laughs> and you have to take exams and get grades. You're getting Columbia credit for it. That's the difference. How is it different in content? Um, it's going to change a bit because certainly COVID has changed and that will be reflected. But, you know, overall, it's going to be very similar because it's a principles course, right? Uh, so um, it, you cannot, I don't think you should not go to class or not listen to the lectures, okay? Um, but if you wanted to do an experiment, you could try that, I suppose. But I'm not condoning it, yep. Well, Brienne's not here, so it's not a question for Brienne. Here we'll answer it. How fast do antibodies attach the virus? If vax people shed virus at all, wouldn't they shed antibody laden or just lower amounts without antibody? So the virus uh, attaches very quickly to antibodies. It's a very, very fast reaction, especially with high affinity antibodies. And um, people who are vaccinated shed less virus for a shorter period of time. It's quite clear. Uh, would they shed antibody 
laden virus. Well, it depends. Like Omicron is probably getting around binding to most of the antibodies, so it wouldn't have uh, antibody laden virus. Um, and um, I don't, I don't, that's a really good question. I don't think people have really looked at that to see if shed virus has any antibody on it. I suspect not. Um, but again, if the, if the affinity is reduced as it is for Omicron, then you're not going to see it bound, if that makes a difference. I don't know um, what happened to DDA Raoul, you know, the hydroxychloroquine guy. Not, I have no idea. That's that's out of my realm there. Vax boosted, still masking. The hospitals are suffering. Yes, um, that's why we're masking for the, to keep the hospitals in shape. I said that earlier. Yep. Was EcoHealth Alliance sloppy in sample collection? No, not at all. E EcoHealth is, does everything right. No question about it. Any plans for a boiled down short version of TWIV concerning the pandemic? I'd like to turn more people onto TWIV, but they don't spend two hours to watch. Uh, I don't know what to tell you, principal manager. I've spent a lot of time making this content, and um, I'm not sure I have time to do more. You mean a short version of each episode? I'd have to get somebody to do that. And, uh, you know, I do have a video guy, but he's got a, a job and he doesn't have infinite time to, to devote to me. Now, I did receive a, a volunteer a while ago for a, from a video guy to do some of that. So maybe I have to... Um, maybe I have to revisit that. Yep. But uh, how long do you want them, Principal Manuals? 60 seconds? Oh, my gosh. So you want me to edit everything people say into 60? I have to pick out the choice bits, right? Okay. Since Omicron mostly spares the lungs, first assumption, you don't know that that's the case, and that was the main killer from Delta. Shouldn't it spare many? So these are all assumptions that we have no data for, MGW. So uh, I don't think any of that is correct. My 80 year old cousin is obese, double vaxxed. He got COVID and never needed to be hospitalized. Well, you know, people are genetically diverse. And so his or your cousin, his or her genetic makeup got him a good immune response. And this happens. Not everyone <laughs> with a comorbidity is going to get hospitalized, right? So the human, human population is quite diverse genetically. What does three mRNA shots with no side effects mean? So I had three mRNA shots and I had barely any side effects. I'm quite sure I'm protected. It's not luck. It's just you didn't respond in that way that gives you side effects. I'm sure you've made vaccine antibodies and T cells, as I have as well. If you would like, you could go get an antibody test and it'll say you're positive and maybe that'll help. It's not fair to ask Vincent to know how EcoHealth ran its business. So I, it's true to an extent. I did speak a couple of times with Peter Daszak, okay? And I got the impression that, and also another employee of EcoHealth, whose name is evading me, but he was on a TWIV as well. And I got the impression that they're doing things properly. But you're right, I, I'm not there in the field. Maybe we are reaching the end. I'm noticing basically the same 15 questions. Sorry. I'm trying to answer them. Um, but there are still over a 1,000 people here, Westfield 90. So people still have questions. It's fine. Don't throw water on it, dude. Thank you, Paul. Could you drop a link to Amy's paper in the YouTube show notes? I'll, I'll try and remember to do that. So you mean the actual... <laughs> the actual um, comments that appear after the video is posted. Okay, I will do that. Yeah. Um, 
So someone said, any news on virology live exam? I'm really sorry. I dropped that ball. I will get that exam posted. Our classroom's super ventilated. Air purifier, HEPA air can open windows outside. Well, I don't know how what, what other schools do, but I haven't been in a I haven't been in a downtown Columbia class in almost two years. And um, up at the medical center where I have been teaching in person, though the windows are sealed, so I have no idea. You think 60% of the world is vaccinated? Let me check. I have a feeling that that sounds a bit high. So we're talking about here. I don't want to see the U.S. I want to see the world. Now the, the, the way, the best place is, um, is, uh, is the world, what is it, world and data. Got to got to sort this out because uh, I'm I'm thinking. Here we go. Um, what is the overall world in data? Yeah, you're right. Sixty percent has got one dose, though. That's one dose. Uh, so that's not enough to get full protection, right? We need two doses. Um, the the Sete Twiv uh, is going to go up in a day or two. I mean, tomorrow I have a class, I have a podcast, maybe tomorrow night. I'm going to have to stay up pretty late. What are scientists looking at that made them determine that boosters are necessary? Frankly, it was nonsense. So the thing, one of the first rhetoric was, remember, after six to eight months, antibody levels contract in the serum, and so people were getting infected. Shortly after the vaccines were given, there weren't infections of vaccinated people. But six to eight months, eight months later, that was starting to happen, and so people started freaking out, even though that's the normal state of things, and protection against disease was still high. So they said, we think disease is going to increase, so we think you should have a booster, which was BS, and that's why I didn't get a booster. And then they changed the rhetoric and said, well, we think the first two doses were too close together and they're measuring antibodies, neutralizing antibodies all the time, nothing else. First two doses too close together, so let's do, do the, the third dose to fix it. No data for that until a study came out of Ontario that we did on TWIV, which showed the third dose really expands the capacity of antibodies to neutralize Omicron, which had just come out about that time. So that convinced me uh, to get the third dose. Although Paul Offit on Twiv recently said there's still no evidence that there was an increase in disease with Omicron in twice vaccinated people. So he th still thinks that the, the need for a booster is minimal unless you want to prevent infection, but you're only going to prevent it for six months. So maybe you want to get the pandemic ended and then stop every six months. That's ridiculous. In my, so that's the story, okay? What does the data say about using Janssen as a boost after being fully vaccinated with mRNA? I'm not aware of those data. I just know that with Janssen, you can get a, a boost of Janssen or mRNA, and that's fine. I'm not aware of the, the inverse. I'm sorry. So uh, I don't know how long I should go tonight. There's still a lot of questions. I'll go a bit more. Let's keep going. I wanted to know why 20% of infected people are the main spreaders. I think it is because uh, those people have the highest, they shed the highest 
amount of infectious virus. And the reason I say that is because um, a study in, in Colorado uh, suggested that that the, the people, but they only used PCR, uh, and you know the people who ten percent of the people had ninety percent of the RNA. But you know, knowing now that PCR doesn't correlate with infectious virus, I think um, that is. Um, I don't really buy that anymore, but it's quite true epidemiologically that most of the transmission is done by a few people. And as I said, I think it's because they they shed the most virus, but nobody's looked at it. It's unfortunate, right? Thank you, Westfield, for your contribution. I appreciate it. Uh, keeps the incubator going. Good day here in Australia. What would be minimum time space between dose two and three? I think five to six. I know your government is doing fewer, and I don't think that's correct. I think it should be five to six. Selection pressure would push the virus towards optimizing infection of the upper tract, but do we know if this needs to be at the expense of its ability to infect the lower airways? No, I don't see why it would have to be that way. You're right. So the transmission all comes from the upper tract, very little from the lower tract. So you want to maximize whatever, shedding from the upper tract, rapidity of shedding, right? Uh, but I don't see why that has to come at the expense of the lower tract. So these studies that say, oh, it's now Omicron is better in the upper than the lower, I just don't buy them. I, I don't see why you have to have this beautiful scenario. Anyway, the, the experiments weren't done properly, as we've said before. My father went in the hospital, 113, he went and got COVID negative in the hospital, accidentally put a COVID positive patient in his room. If negative on day five, how likely for him? So he's in the, he was in the room for five days. Uh, he Probably the other guy is one of those who don't transmit, right? The uh, 80% who don't transmit. So after five days, I think you're good. Thank you, Mark, for your contribution. Yeah, it's, it's her show. I told her I was doing this to, to push her forward. It's her show. She brings you here. Um, I have other shows. <laughs> it is good. Endemic means the general population is getting bored with it all. That's great. I love it. Principal manager saw the needle tour twiv. Why are hospitalizations so high in New Jersey? Because they're unvaccinated. Either that or they have severe comorbidities. What is the outlook for the 4 billion humans not net vaccinated? Well, hopefully they can get vaccinated. And the problem is getting vaccine to them, right? Because if they're not vaccinated, they're going to get infected. So either they're going to be vaccinated or infected. Endemic means it's here. It's existing in a, any population. You know, a virus could be endemic to New Jersey. It's not, we don't do that, but you only find it in New Jersey. It could be endemic in the U.S. It can be endemic in the world. Not all viruses are endemic everywhere, right? There are restrictions, vector restrictions and so forth. Dengue is not endemic in the northern U.S., but it's endemic in the tropics where the mosquito is, where the mosquito vector is, which means it's always there. It's not always causing epidemics, but it's there, and it could flare up at any time. That's endemic, and that's where we are now with this one. It's not going anywhere. Thoughts on the Army's vaccine? I don't see why it's any better than any other vaccine. It's a protein-based vaccine, which is like Novavax. It has a different way of making its aggregates. And it seems like the end results are the same as all the others. Great, more vaccines. It's good. Some people are asking, who, who funds the anti-vaxxers? It's well known. 
that all of the anti-vaxxers, the big ones, you can you can name them. They're compensated for their efforts. That's why they do it. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue about it. It's true. Got a lot of comments here. I'm sorry to have gaps in between, but I'm reading through and trying to rule out the duplicates, right? I'm hungry. I'm not. I'm okay. I had had a little pasta before I came down here. Do elderly people remain infectious longer than a 25? I don't believe so. I think they can shed RNA for a while, maybe longer, but it's not infectious. So I don't think there's any evidence for that. Why has an IgA vaccine not been developed? Because we really don't. So, so to get an IgA vaccine, you want IgA goes to mucosal surfaces, right? And so we don't know how to do that. We we're really lucky with the human papillomavirus vaccine. But uh, all the others, um, it's a problem. We don't know how to do it. People are working on it, but it's going to, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, hard to do. Yeah, holy crap, CT40. Can you believe it? It's insane. That's the China thing, right? For the, for the what was it, the Olympics or something? If you take 5 million virus particles, does it become visible? No, 5 million is nothing. Nothing. We polio virus can grow up to 10 to the ninth PFU per mil, and it's clear as day. You need much more than that, for sure. A lot of a lot of pot discussion here. Why does pot smell so different these days? You know, I smell it all the time in New York City on the streets, on the trains. And when I was in college, it smelled really different. I don't get it. And everyone smells of it, even if they're not smoking it. What's going on? <laughs> Guy on the train next to me, completely saturated. And I don't, the, the smell in college, I liked a lot more. Are the next SARS-CoV-2 variants less likely to cause severe symptoms because we are generating T cells against spike due to prior infections and vaccinations? Well, I mean, it, it depends who you're talking about. V vaccinated people are getting infected, right? We've been talking about that all night. So they're getting boosted. And they may be seeing variants and making T cells against the variants. And so that probably contributes. So it's a win-win, right? If you're vaccinated two or three times, you're going to get infected and it's going to boost you and you're going to improve your immunity. Um, and, and, you know, to a certain extent, unvaccinated people who are multiply infected can do the same thing as well. Referencing TWIV 854, how do we know infectious viral load measured in the lab correlates to person to person transmission? Well, there's, that's the best you can do, Ben. You you get nasal wash, which is about to come out of someone's nose, right? And you measure infectious virus in it. That that's, comes out of your nose. That's what you're transmitting. I don't see what the problem is. Thank you, Ronnie, for your contribution. My 80-year-old father, colon and prostate cancer, high blood pressure, quadruple bypass, high cholesterol, had COVID, and he only had diarrhea and got tired. All right. See, that's the thing. Just because you have comorbidities doesn't mean you're going to die. It just is a likelihood that you'll be severely ill or die. But not everyone does, and this is a great example. Thank you. Thank you. Got vaccinated and boosted and caught COVID. What would have to happen to take another? You're good. You're not going to have to take another vaccine because you're going to get infected probably once a year. You're not going to know it. or Maybe you have the sniffles, and it's going to keep boosting you. You're good. Absolutely. I haven't heard it much about thromboembolic events in, in, in a long time. Has this been less of an issue? 
No, there's still issues with the vectored, adenovirus vectored vaccines. And um, they still occur. But the press, it's old news, so the press doesn't report it. But but it's out there. Uh, D- Daniel talked about it a few weeks ago, I believe. Here in New Zealand, most of the population have not had any COVID. What will be the impact of Omicron? About 90% of adults vaccinated, 5 to 11-year-olds starting this week. Well, that 90% is great. You're going to have mild infections with any variant. There won't be any particular impact. Uh, is Amy saying the obese who are vaccinated and boosted are on death row? No. She's just saying that obesity is the major comorbidity of concern for, for severe COVID, which doesn't mean it's guaranteed. It's not, they're not on death row, as I, I've just said multiple times. No, not at all. We're all genetically different. Thank you, Ronnie, for your contribution. Zoonotic spillovers could be happening that are benign, but no one would know to look because there would be no symptomatology. Good point. Very good point. I like that. Yes, because someone asked earlier, are there any benign spillovers? We wouldn't know, especially there are no symptoms and we're not looking for it. If it causes just a mild cold, we say, I have a cold and we never look at it. Good point. Very good point. My wife is on hydroxychloroquine. Is that an immunosuppressive med? No. No, it is not. Any plans to have Xi Zhongli as a guest? I'd love to. Uh, we could do it via Zoom, right? So listen to this. When I was in Singapore in December 2019, I was doing a couple of twivs, including with uh, Peter Dashak of EcoHealth and others. I went to the university and gave a, did a twiv there, National University of Singapore. And the student said, there were some students from China there. I'm not sure why. And they said, next year we'll invite you to Wuhan. They were going to have a virology meeting in 2020 in Wuhan. I said, I'll be there. I could have done that. With it, but, of course, we never went because of the pandemic. So I'm not sure I'm going there anytime soon. But we could do a Zoom. I, I bet she might do it. I don't know. doesn't hurt to ask, right? Are there any viruses that cause disease in humans that have a non-animal reservoir like plants? No. No, they're all... So the, you know, the mosquito transmitted have mammalian reservoirs like West Nile, Zika virus, etc. No, not, not non-animal, uh, no. Is it imperative to get a booster or do you think two vaccines will protect you? I got a booster because I thought the data look good that a booster corrected having the first two doses too close together. However, it may still be that two doses close together will protect you against severe disease and hospitalization. I don't think we have those data yet. Um, so I did it just to be safe. But in fact, as I said, Paul Offit doesn't think they're needed and they may not be. But we, I can't really tell you right now. It's possible that they might be okay. Two may be enough. Sarah, I'm finally awake and time to watch from Italy. Hey, I'm a science dude who got dud, none dud. Yeah, I guess dud, 17% in your last exam. Now I'm all up on the T cells and I know what a plaque assay is. Good for you. And enjoy that food in Italy. <laughs> Love it. Novavax has been pro- provisionally approved in Australia for first and second doses. Big mistake. They are specking three weeks space. And that's not good. Why are they doing three weeks? Probably because that's how they did the trials, right? You can't change it. Yeah, so if you get COVID after being triple vaxxed, you're getting a boost. You're good, and you can probably have that every year, and that's going to keep population immunity high. If I had COVID in August... I'll get to Kent. First dose in Feb, second in March. Do I need the booster? No. 
infected, recovered, and, and vaccinated once is sufficient. And Steph, th I forgot to thank you at the onset. Thank you for moderating tonight. We have, um, let's see, we have Tom, we have Steph, we have Les, we have Frank, and we have Vanity Nutrition. Look at that, five mods. I'm so grateful to your work. Thank you so much for putting in your time. And now here I, I take you to two and a half hours. Have I heard about Hillary Kaprowski? Yeah, I got a picture with him. I, I met him multiple times. I have his book that he autographed for me here. I have a photo next to him. Yes, I know about Hillary Kaprowski. And thank you for your contribution. I really appreciate it. I remember an old twiv where an older gentleman, noted virologist, stated that he carried polio pills in his pocket while out in New York City restaurants. Who was that? Polio pills. I have no idea. My, I should remember all the old parasites. <laughs> all the old episodes. Why am I saying parasites? I don't know. I, I, I'd have to go back. I don't know. It's, a, <laughs> it's really great. Maybe... Somebody else on TWIV knows. What's the deal with this gain-of-function term that politicians are throwing around? <laughs> it's nothing new. They've been throwing it around since the, the, the H5N1 ferret transmission experiments. Um, so gain-of-function is any experiment where you give an organism a new property. It doesn't have to be a virus. It could be bacteria, fungi. When you make better wine, you're giving gain of function to the yeast that are fermenting it or whatever. There are other organisms in there as well. Uh, we made transgenic mice. Gain of function in mice. No problem. Most experiments are gain of function. And so they think it's bad. They think gain of function created SARS-CoV-2, which is absurd. I mean, they just don't understand. The politicians don't get it. They're using it for political means. That's it. So gain of function is good. Never a bad thing came out of gain of function. I, I defy you to show me because I've been doing gain of function for 40 years and none of you have, all right? So don't tell me that it's done bad things. Uh, there was another one. When do you think we will get resistance to Paxlovid? This year. You heard it here on Q&A, this year. Um, I'm triple vaxxed. I wear a mask social all the time. However, when I get my hair cut, my barber doesn't wear his mask. Is it safe to get my hair cut? Do you wear a mask when you get your hair cut? You could. My hair cutter wants me to wear a mask and she, you know, she'll pull up the ear thing and cut under it and it's kind of a pain. Um, but you're fine. You're triple vaxxed. You're fine. The, at the worst, you're going to get a sniffle. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Vince's first lecture of his YouTube virology course is chock full of mind-blowing stuff. Yes, I think it's a cool course. You ought to listen to it. Why would it be better to only test the unvaccinated? Well, as I said, they should be tested because uh, we'd like to know if they're infected and then maybe they're living with other unvaccinated and you want to protect them. So I, I think that's a good plan unless you are vaccinated, but you're living with. So there's a small chance that you could transmit even if you're vaccinated. I think it's much lower than an unvaccinated person, but it's still not zero. So if you have a young kid, you might want to test. That's what we said earlier. Seeing eastern equine encephalitis more, especially in the Midwest. Yeah, I think climate change, warming is increasing mosquito range for sure. Lisa, thank you for your contribution. Really appreciate it. So we got 1,000 people, 566 thumbs up. Just hit a thumbs up uh, right below the video because it helps more people see us. And we get more money. Just, just helps people see us because I want to teach more and more people. Yes, we are overreacting to Omicron. It's just another bloody variant. It happens to be more evasive than others, but if you're vaccinated, you're fine. If you're not vaccinated, it's just as bad as any other variant. 
And we talked about the hamsters in Hong Kong already. The Denmark study claims 80% efficacy of Pfizer with Omicron. Uh, I don't think you can compare that unless you show that the population is identical. So that's the problem with doing a, a study where it's not. Is Omicron more immune evasive than other variants? Well, it's only been compared to Delta, right? Because those two in Denmark were co-circulating. And I don't think you can compare it to any others because they're different populations, right? You think it's a good idea to keep masking during high disease months from now on? I seem to see it in places like China. I wonder if they knew something we should have known. Well, they were masking from the beginning, right? So... I think we have vaccines that work. We don't need to mask. It's obviously different from the Asian experience, but I think that you're going to get a mild disease and it's it's not an issue. You don't need to wear a mask all the time. Is anyone monitoring hospitalization post-COVID? Yes, of course. We, on Daniel Griffin's updates, we talk about that all the time for sure. Who are the best contacts for long COVID treatments? I don't know, but Daniel Griffin would know. I don't know where you are, but send an email to daniel at microbe.tv and he'll, he'll answer you. Hmm. I had two AstraZeneca's in COVID. I'm good. You're good. You don't need a boost unless you want. I don't think you need to to get it. Angela Rasmussen billed as famed virologist. Good for that. I, she got her PhD with me, you know. For reference, when virologists do gain of function, they never do it with full viruses. Yes, of course they do. They do it with full virus, with infectious viruses, yes. And it's been going on for years, and nothing untoward has happened because they do it under the right containment. I'm going to go to 10.30. You know, I was, I was taking the train home, and I said, uh, tonight I'm going to go to 10 because I'm, I had a... Uh, it felt crappy because something went wrong during my virology class today. I f couldn't figure it out, and I felt – so I'm just going to do till 10. But now that I'm here and, and seeing all you people, you good people, I'm going to go to 1030. I'm trying to cultivate more positive interactions with viruses like bacteriophages and the viral satellites that can give you super powers like the aphids that grow wings. Yes, that's a good idea, animal party chain thank you for your contribution was uh, so i answered your question i i don't think that's necessary are you aware of study results show spread of sars-cov-2 by contact of a contaminated surface no i'm not and it was a concern on at the beginning because we didn't know but it, it's mainly droplet transmitted for sure uh, for sure Isn't the vaccine of Peter Hotez extra sensitive to variants because it only has RBD? So that's there's an interesting thought on that. So some studies have shown that if you just use RBD, you can you can induce some very broadly neutralizing antibodies that you wouldn't get with the whole spike. So that's the plus. Yeah, but the negative is that many changes occur in the RBD, um, and there are fewer T cell epitopes in the RBD. So I'm not sure RBD is a good idea, frankly. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, the rhinoviruses were probably nasty at some point when they spilled over from animals. Exactly right. Exactly right. And Ian, thank you so much for your contribution. We never know what invaluable knowledge may come from pure research. Competing for grants selects 
for apparently useful research, not blue sky thinking. You're absolutely right. You you don't get any points for being um, inventive or or out there. You they want points. They want to see you do do something that's going to work. And I get a frequent criticism. We get a frequent criti criticism of our applications, which this is not going to work. It's not going to tell us anything. To which I say, how do how the hell do you know? Are you a seer that you know it's not going to work? You're just saying that because you can't think of anything better to criticize it with. And that's what really pisses me off. They should just discard those comments automatically. But the review process is flawed, so they don't. Thank you, Jake, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Why did V say we didn't shouldn't have to vaccinate in five years? I'm confused. Okay, here, listen again, one more time. We're reaching, at some point, most of the population is going to be immune. As you've seen from the vaccinated people, if you're vaccinated, you have mild disease. So if most of the world is immune, either through vaccination or infection, hence most of the infections are going to be mild. You're going to get infected every year. That's going to be your boost every year. You don't need vaccines at some point in the future. New kids are born. They'll get antibodies from their mothers that protect them. They may get infected early on. Because of their mother's antibodies, they'll be protected. They'll make their own immune response, and they'll be immune for the rest of their life. They'll never get serious disease. The serious disease came because this virus went into a population that had zero immunity. That's why I say no vaccines after five years. Did I ever want to do anything besides virology? Well, I often say no, but there was a time when I didn't even know what viruses were, right? But early in my life, I didn't have any career idea. Um, and here's the thing. My, my father was a doctor. He, he wanted me to be a doctor. So I went to college. I wanted to be a science major. I liked science. I didn't know what I would do with it. I had no clue. Um, I went to college, majored in biology, and I didn't want to go to medical school. So I ended up graduating with nothing. So I read Fever, and I said, I want to be a virologist. And so that did it. But before then, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So, yes, I didn't want to ever do anything else. Speaking of Danishes, do you have Copenhagen's in New York? I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> does parental immunity get passed to the fetus in womb? Yes, from the mother to the fetus and also through breast milk. Yep. So, yes, antibodies can cross the placenta and you can get them in breast milk as well. You think that since Omicron has a short incubation period, it can cause disease before T-cells are activated. No, I think a couple of days is plenty to get T-cells activated. Remember, your local lymph nodes are going to be draining the antigen from the infected respiratory tract, the upper tract. They're going to see it right away, or else there'll be local antigen-presenting cells that bring it in. No, it's no problem. Not at all. Why would the, the disease become more... Like the cold, V keeps saying that viruses don't tend to become milder. Right, the virus is not changing. Our, we're getting immune. That's the difference. The virus is not mutating to be less virulent. We are getting population immunity, and that's protecting us because if you're immune, you get less severe disease. My infections were no worse than a cold, but long haul is devastating. Will long haul rise in several years when all infections are mild? Well, so far the this situation with vaccinated people is that long haul is, is very rare. It's not zero, but it's extremely rare. I forgot the numbers that Daniel keeps saying. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. It's, all, it's an interesting question, right? What data is there that Omicron is as dangerous? The data is that if you're unvaccinated and you get infected, you end up in the hospital. If you're vaccinated, it's milder. Yeah, because more people are vaccinated now. But people unvaccinated getting Omicron get the same spectrum of disease. There's no evidence that it's any milder. Is there a selective balance between transmission and virulence? I think this is a theory of viral evolution, right? That um, uh, 
there's a balance. You want to transmit really well, but you don't want to kill people. But, you know, in practice, these viruses are not killing huge percentages of their hosts. There's still plenty of hosts to be around. So I don't think that's an issue. I think there is a selection for transmission. But proving it is very difficult. And just look at the Danish study, the Denmark study, um, which said Omicron is evasive. It's not more transmissible intrinsically, right? It's hard to do. Would you feel milder phantom symptoms if you're exposed but were boosted? You might. You might feel nothing. You might have mild symptoms, cold-like, sniffles, and so forth. Yeah. That's what most people are feeling. Thank you, Hayden, for your contribution. Do I have a link to a paper to why it's best to wait six months? I think I just uh, showed it earlier. That was the paper that uh, Amy was showing. But it is in a recent TWIV. And maybe it's a paper out of Ontario. Maybe I don't want to search for it right now, but maybe someone will post it. If not, send an email to Vincent at microbe.tv. The data have shown that boosted are 80% less likely to be hospitalized than fully. It depends where you're looking. I don't know where you get these data from. Not clear to me that those data are available. Have I got a booster? Yes, I got a booster some time ago. And two, two days later, Columbia said you have to have a booster to get on campus. So. I uh, I guess I did it in time, right? But it's a science that I believe that it, it fixed the close spacing of the first two doses. That's why I did it. But in terms of disease, I'm not convinced yet that the boost makes an impact on disease because two doses already makes an impact on disease. Uh, home where I work is 90% vaxxed, but they're still getting infected. yes. But are they getting sick? Are they getting severely ill? Are they going to the hospital? That's what the vaccines are doing. They're not preventing infection. They are preventing severe disease. Thank you, Jerry, for your contribution. Uh, measles vaccine sterilizing. Some people say yes. Some people say no. So I have to do some research on that. Good question. Okay. Hello, Jeff. Twitter beats Twitter hands down. That's a great saying. I was on Jeff's pod last night. Maybe, Jeff, you can tell them where they can find it because uh, we had a good time, right? All right, so let's spin down here. Let's see uh, if we can thank people who've made donations. Why the hostility towards nurse aspirate Campbell? Because uh, I don't see any evidence that aspiration makes a difference. It's a theoretical idea, right? But no study has proven it makes a difference. Neither did Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Bad Cat, for your contribution. I am going to an event that requires vax boost, negative lab test, plus masks. It makes sense. No, not among all vaccinated people. If if they can get around the vaccination requirement, maybe they would be susceptible. But no, not for you. It doesn't make masking doesn't make any sense. I don't think we need to mask in those situations. Not not at all. Oh, thank you, Amy. Look, another Amy. You're way cooler than Joe. Nah, Joe is just a cultural phenomenon, right? And millions of people love Joe. I don't need millions of people to like me. Um, I just wish more people would listen. They don't have to like. Uh, would you go on Rogan? Yeah, I've said many times. He will never have me on because I've been on Lex Friedman and he probably figures that's enough. They're buddies, right? And apparently I know nothing about Rogan's podcast. Sure. Uh, that is a crappy, that is a crappy um, comment. And, you know, it doesn't require you to be removed, but that's pretty crappy. 
How do you know I know nothing? You just want to say that because you like them. Kathy, thank you so much for your contribution. I really appreciate it. The, the ideal dosing space would be six months for the mRNA vaccines, but that leaves you open for a long time, right? So, um, the, the, you know, if you've, that's, that's in part why they're doing kids with the three, four week, because they don't want to keep them um, susceptible for a long period of time. My gosh, really good questions. Next week, come back next week. Thank you uh, for your contribution. Ald Philip 2003, COVID reinfection is impossible. No, no, it's not impossible. Disease is less likely. But, um, uh, yeah, we get reinfected all the time. It's quite clear. It's been documented. First Omicron came from surface contact. Well, I don't see any proof for that. So I think it's un unlikely. Callista, thank you for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Bad cat, thank you very much. Experts say we will all be infected. If we're recently boosted with peak antibodies, would this be a good time to get infected? Well, no, you won't be infected. If you have peak antibodies, the virus won't get hold in you. You want to be later down the line when you're going to get infected, mild symptoms, and get boosted naturally. It's going to happen. There's no question about it. I'm not advocating, I am not advocating uh, COVID parties. <laughs> Thank you, Ado. You're going to live too with John Campbell. Yeah, I know he's got a lot of followers. I think it's absurd because he doesn't know anything about viruses. I just, I, I, he has some knowledge. That's fine. But he doesn't know anything about viral genetics. He doesn't know anything about transmissibility. He just reinterprets. I'm sure at least millions of people love him, but they should be listening to me as well. Uh, there is one commercially available t test for T cells but it only says yes or no, so it's not very useful. Yeah, so here we go. Uh, I, he's not a virologist. He should stay in his lane. Vincent goes by the data and not my gut feeling. That's it. So I don't think someone would should have 2 million followers for doing that, but he does, and we have 106,000. That's the world we live in. Thank you, Ken, for your contribution my mid 50s very very morbid obese but perfect blood stats uh does triple vax prevent protect you are in the group where or this person this theoretical person is in the group where you could have severe disease not guaranteed it's not a death sentence as someone said earlier but you are in the group that would be more likely to have it it doesn't mean you're going to have it Okay, let's see here. Let's thank some people. Gabriel, thank you for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Stephen, thank you for your contribution. All this goes to the incubator. Thank you, Overjoyed. Would a six-month booster every six months prevent infection? It would, but I don't think that's what we're going to do. That's on, you know, for the rest of your life, every six months? I don't think so, but maybe you could do that. Well, you already have long COVID, right? I don't think that's a bad idea. Everyone talks about <laughs> antibodies and T-cells. Why no love for innate immunity? Well, I love innate immunity. We've worked on it. We think that people who develop severe COVID have an early, weak, innate response that allows the virus to reproduce too much and cause more problems. Yeah. Yeah, but you're right. They talk about neutralizing antibodies. Thank you, Ted, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Everyone's support is needed to keep science education going. Thank you, the Hebrew bar barrister. My five-year-old daughter got infected a few days after second Pfizer, mild disease. Did it mess with her response? No, I don't believe so. It's just adding to the vaccine. I think she'll be fine. Jason, thank you so much. Uh, the pot is magnitudes better. You mean today than it was? Oh, because that's why it smells differently? <laughs> Yeah. I'm zipping to the end. I'm, I'm unfortunately skipping a lot of great questions, but I hope you bring them back next week. And I don't know, someone said, it's not the same 15 questions. It's, it's a lot of stuff. Thank you, Brent, for your contribution.
appreciate it. And thank you, Mystery, for your contribution. Thank you, Riri, for your contribution. Did I ever study with E.O. Wilson? No, I never did. Thank you, Siddhartha, for your contribution. And Jeff's podcast is Godless Heathens. Talk about the intersection of politics and religion. But we didn't talk about that at all. We talked about COVID. Now we're talking about Friedman and Co and Rogan. All right, there we go. I've reached the end of thanking. I want to thank all the moderators tonight for helping out. Thanks all of you for coming. Great crowd, great questions. And uh, come back next week. If you didn't get your question answered, uh, come back next week. Uh, and um, ask Lex to get you on Rogan. Well, he was on the phone with Rogan while I was down there, and he didn't um, <clears throat> he didn't show any propensity to have me on. He knew I was there. He knew what I was talking about. I'm just not famous enough for Rogan. Um, so, you know, that's it. I mean, I'm trying to find the uh, the logo to end the show. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Good night.